So I, I know you wanted to talk about the edibility test. That was something you wanted to talk about, you know, because we've got this issue with Chinese whispers. Yes. So um, having a background in military, in survival courses, army, and doing the air force, and what I've noticed, and of course the edibility test has a, a military background. That was where it was originally come mm -hmm. from. So that's why um, I wanted to talk about that. But it's it's come into the, the civilian play as well in various forms and various um, variations, which I'll get you to, to go into. Um, but from a, a military perspective, and I'll get you to talk about what that what the edibility test is, mm -hmm. and well, there's a short form. It's taught um, in the Army for specific reasons, and in the Air Force about generally how to identify a plant. If you don't, don't know anything about the plants, um, how to go through a series of tests to identify whether something's edible in its shortest phase with a few physical physical tests. My personal problem with the test is um, it's very long-winded, but and it's the only thing taught. Mm. It's uh, at the exclusion of everything else, mm -hmm. and at, because and I I don't mean to be negative or, or pointing finger. I'm not at all. It's just an observation. But generally, one of the problems I see is that people um, and instructors don't have a deep enough plant knowledge and and my knowledge compared to what you have is like i feel like a complete numpty and um it's it, it is everything bushcraft plant knowledge and tree identification is everything and that should be you know particularly i mean i'm not talking about having a global one but you should have commonalities and particularly for your area it is one of the weakest areas that I find that I have seen in my experience with, with the military's people's plant ID is generally very, mm -hmm. very poor. Mm -hmm. And um, it comes down to who delivers that lesson and, and the experience of that, that, that instructor. And for some reason, all the time is spent on the edibility test with very little time of actually going and identifying mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. And I think it's... Uh, because either people don't know their plants or they're too lazy to learn them. I'm not sure what it is, but I see that right across the board. Yeah, well, my experience of the edibility test is more seeing how it's portrayed across the literature, across the internet. And one of the things I see is an inconsistency in how it's portrayed. And that's one of the things that I've tried to address in my work is just that it's often applied, and the inconsistency comes from it not being um, portrayed completely and so it often starts at a certain point through the physical process and we can talk about that in a minute but it often doesn't include other elements um, that you, when it's written out fully should be included and then there's some other elements that I rarely see being taught that we can go into in terms of how you target the test when you are using it so regardless of whether or not you add any other botanical knowledge around that I have some particular problems with the way that it's presented generally because I think it's dangerous the way I, and also people can just use it as a crutch and mm -hmm. as an excuse not to learn more deeply which ultimately would be more useful to them okay exactly um, as Gordon said there are, there are various versions of this um, in print and online and that's partly down to Chinese whispers that it gets transmitted incorrectly or partially and we can come back to that but fundamentally the way that this test is usually portrayed is to take an unfamiliar plant and to take one part of that plant and then to test your body for sensitivity to that plant and it's done initially is a contact test so you do it make sure that you know you find a sensitive part of your body like the inside of your elbow the back of your knee or something like that and make sure you don't come up in a rash before you put it into your so rub it on there make sure because some plants will cause a contact reaction due to the chemicals that are in those or plants. after smell first or, um, yeah so yeah, yeah but the, but that doesn't always yes, get that right. doesn't always get put in right, there right okay. so like I say, the, the generic way that this is described, and I've seen it in, in a number of ways, um, that there are there are a bunch of precursors that should be there that are often not 
portrayed, right? So what we're not trying to do here is teach you the edibility test. What I'm actually wanting to do, and what I know Gordon wanted to talk about, was talk about the problems with the way that it's taught, um, as well as maybe the problems with applying it. And you can go away and do some research. You can Google it and you'll find five different versions of it immediately and you'll understand what we're talking about in terms of the problems. But the way that generically it's described is you do some sort of sensitivity test on the outside of your body and then if that doesn't come up in a rash you then do some sensitivity on the inside of it so you maybe put it on the inside of your lip in between your lip and your and your gum and then it set then then you maybe chew a small amount and then you maybe chew a small amount and swallow and wait make sure you don't have an adverse reaction in terms of vomiting etc and you wait a certain amount of time and then you can you can then deem that safe to to consume or or not and that's a very mm. you know i'm not going to go into time frames it's, as i say you can go away and research that it finishes up on digesting yeah so you consume mm. some you you you've consumed a small amount you wait an amount of time and then if if um if you have no adverse reaction at any stage of that then you can assume that that part of that plant that you've um tested is safe to consume and you can you can ingest some and the longer the stage the longer that process of waiting is so it can be quite a substantial yeah it, it can there. so that there can be there's hours and hours and hours during the stage so there's a there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of things that i dive and one of the reasons that gordon would want to have this conversation there's a couple of things i've said about this uh to gordon over the years and um some of it's about just the way it's badly presented like there is a protocol there which works but and i have some issues with the protocol itself but even when it's presented um online or in books often it's not presented the correct protocol is not presented in full or presented correctly and that's part of the issue um my general problems with it are that if you have the way that it's presented a lot of the time is you t you're just in an area and you test a plant now it's it's scientific right you are getting data and you are progressing but the problem is the only time you're ever going to do this is if you're really quite hungry mm. um, and you don't know any of the plants there that are that are edible so you've got no knowledge of edible plants and in you're going area. to be in that pit at that area for a considerable period of time possibly to go through that. possibly yeah but the, the point is that the only reason you're going to do this is if you're hungry right because if you weren't hungry you wouldn't need to be testing random plants okay um, but the way that it's presented often doesn't create any sort of hierarchy about what you should be testing right that's that's my first mm. issue right and we can come back to that but there is you know no hierarchy should I be testing this plant or this plant or this plant because these tests can take a day like in terms of waiting eight hours between this and this and this and this um, and then if you did if you did find a plant that's ingestible and you start ingesting that then that invalidates you testing another plant because you're supposed to have an empty stomach when you do these ingestion tests so there's a, there's a timing issue mm. there um, and so, you need to target thing what's your idea yeah most so, reward yeah, exactly thing. but there's often no description about targeting any particular part of the plant so what you should be doing and what generally i i've rarely seen this portrayed i've only heard this from talking to senior u.s air force instructors who were teaching this years ago when it was first introduced and basically what you should be doing is you should first off if you're in an area what you should be looking at is what are the common plants what are common and widespread in the area because if there's only one of them in extremists there's no point testing it because mm. you're not going to eat it you're not going to find another one you want to find something where there's lots of it okay and then what you also want is you, if i gave you on a survival exercise a bag of salad every day <laughs> like here's a bag of rocket and mm. gem lettuce and you know lolo rosso lettuce and there's a nice bag of salad right you wouldn't be particularly impressed right after a week of that so you don't want to be testing green leafy parts of plants because it's a waste of time mm. yet yeah, even if they are edible you are not going to get a lot of calories from it you're not going to get a lot of energy 
And if you make yourself ill, then you're just in a worse position than you were. What you need to be looking for are sources of energy. So you want to be looking for fruits, nuts, and roots primarily. Sometimes shoots. At certain times of the year, the only thing you've got is shoots. So you want roots, shoots, and fruits. Because those roots, shoots, and fruits are where the energy is going to be. So if you think back to what we were targeting last week on the intermediate course, we were targeting rhizomes of, of Tifa, we were targeting the underground storage organs of things like burdock, Arctium lapa, we were targeting fruits of various plants that are available at this time of year, and we were getting the, the sugars and the complex carbs from those, from those plants, and they, they are worthwhile in terms of targeting. Um, and so if you didn't know any of the plants, it's those parts of the plants that you need to be targeting. So what's common in the area, what's widespread over that area, what can I then get a root or a shoot or a fruit from and test that because if that's edible, I can then get a lot of energy. So that's the first thing that I rarely see being taught. I see, you know, I see people doing it on YouTube with leaves and it's just, it's pointless. It's totally pointless as a survival exercise. So the, that is a big issue that I have with so it. Targeting something is going to have calorific value, yes. widespread and common that you're going to get basically the most bang for your yeah. buck from and spend your time doing those yeah. things. If not, yeah. it's not important. And now the other thing that I never see anybody talking about, but being someone who knows a fair amount about trees and plants is that you need to be able to identify that plant again, right? So there may be multiple different plants that look similar in an area and the problematic family that rises to the top of my head but it's by no means the only one but the problematic family that it would be familiar to many people certainly in the northern hemisphere is the carrot family because they have these uh, uh, umbelliferous flower structures that look they look like an umbrella and they typically have white or creamy flowers. Some of them have yellowish flowers, but it's very easy to tell that they are in the carrot family. Yeah, they, they have similar structures. They have once, twice, three times pinnate leaf structures. They've got um, either hollow or solid stems. They, they are normally quite large. They have single or multiple umbelliferous flower structures. And they all have those things in common, give or take. But then telling them apart can be quite tricky and the problem that that's the reason that's a problem is because some of them are really edible and some of them are really poisonous. And this is a good this is a good example um, for even for people who know nothing about botany. And um, because if you go into your local food market, you're gonna find celery, mm. you're gonna find parsley, you're gonna find fennel, you're gonna find carrots, you're gonna find uh, parsnips, you're gonna find uh, cumin and coriander, coriander seed, these are all members of the carrot family, right? And they're important commercially and they're important nutritionally. Um, but you might also know about some notoriously poisonous plants. So everyone's heard of hemlock, even if they maybe have never seen it or couldn't recognize it in the world, in the wild, anywhere in, in, in the world that it occurs. And um, they might have even heard about Socrates drinking a cup of hemlock and, you know, being poisoned. Um, they may have or may not have heard of giant hogweed, they may have heard of cowbane, they may have heard of hemlock water dropwort, which is a different plant to hemlock, um, Oenantha crocata as opposed to Conium maculatum. Um, but they're all seriously poisonous plants in one way or another. Some of them have got multiple toxins, some cause contact problems, some also cause in, in problems if you ingest them, and some, if you eat enough of them, will kill you. Um, and so the problem is telling that family apart. Um, so even if you took, say, an edible uh, plant and in that family and tested it and you ate some of the root and, and you did all the sensitivity tests and you end up ingesting some and it was like, okay, there's no problems there and you eat some and you have a meal of it. The problem then is, okay, I've tested this plant but now there's a bunch of other plants that look similar. And mm. the reason you're doing these tests is because you're an ignoramus, right? Literally, and no disrespect, like 
if you knew your plants you would not need to do this test so the reason you're testing mm. this plant is because you don't know what it is and you don't know anything about botany and you don't know about differentiating between plants so that family then is problematic because you can I, like, I've got this plant with a stem and it's got feathery frilly leaves that are a bit fern like and it's got this white umbrella like flower structure and I've dug out the roots that look a bit parsnip like and I've tested them and it's okay and then there's another one that looks similar but it isn't the same plant and your ability to differentiate between them is problematic even as someone potentially much further up the curve with with botanical um, identification that, than you are and so you've got then the potential to poison yourself with that family and so that's something I also don't hear people talking about is that even when you've tested a plant and you've ingested it and it's all good you need to be able to then replicate the identification of that plant and find the same plant in an area where there may be similar plants now that's why when that test is correctly displayed and presented there's a whole precursor set of exclusions mm. which comes down to which others might know as the the nine poison indicators well not or nine or ten well not necessarily those right but if you look at the if you look at the tests as they were originally presented right there are things that are totally excluded yeah and it isn't always couched in that in that nine that you're talking about so plants with white umbiliferous flower structures you don't bother testing right mm. that if you look at the test as it was originally proposed and presented there are things that you do not even bother with for exactly the reason that I'm talking about but you don't have people don't understand the reason why they don't and because because as you say even a lot of instructors particularly in the military don't know how to identify these plants and don't know how to differentiate between them they don't understand the importance in the first place of not even mm. bothering to test them and so if you look at the test as it's properly presented there's a bunch of exclusions and one of them I won't go through all of them but one of them is basically to exclude the carrot family because it you cannot you you can test a mm. particular plant and find that that plant is ingestible or not but then being able to transfer that knowledge to other plants and be able to accurately differentiate is is not possible particularly for somebody with low botanical knowledge so you just don't bother even testing anything that looks like that and I rarely see that presented it particularly on websites so you've got quite large survival websites that are largely there to generate um, traffic via Google by people searching and they're set up to generate ad revenue and they've got all the classic bits and pieces that you'd expect you know in a survival manual but often those websites don't present these things properly and they just start at the rubbing it on your elbow mm. bit or sticking it in your lips bit and there's no pre-exclusions there there's nothing talking about poison indicators you know milky saps and all those sorts of things that do you want to just run through those nine um milky saps because there's exceptions to all these rules yeah. and i notice some circles this is not even talked about mm. uh, some have waxy leaves milky sap furry stems prickly stems trumpet shaped flowers nothing wrong with trumpets as well although <laughs> pea pods fungi um palmate leaves just some of the main ones how many is that that's probably close mm. uh what else we is it it's uh opposite leaves um so all of those are general poison indicators they're only general because they're exceptions to all those rules such as the the um, milky sap with a lot of the ficus um, our figs uh, they have milky sap yet the edible figs um, red the sap, berries the saps will still cause irritation yeah. though in ficus so, yeah with that with the except say so with the the fruits mm -hmm. are edible yeah, yeah. Um, but yet we've got dandelions red dandelions is another example dandelion taraxicum dandelions they've got milky saps but they're edible so so and with all those but so it's only if you don't know what you yeah. what you're dealing with there's some but then some actually have op opposite leaves um well some of the mint oh, most mint. of, most of the mints most of the mints um but the, but the the some some of that is is regional so uh, you know particularly in tropical areas some of that stuff is is more important than it is in temperate areas um but 
the, the reason there are those exclusions are because um, it just saves you wasting time like a lot of things with waxy leaves are toxic so even in my environment here um, holly uh, cherry laurel rhododendron yew they've all got waxy leaves dark waxy leaves and they're all poisonous so that is quite a good you know just don't even bother with those um, a lot of a lot of milky saps do cause irritation so euphorbiaceae the ficus etc they all cause um irri irritation um so it's just to avoid you wasting your time but some of the other exclusions are also because you can't easily differentiate between them so but mm -hmm. that often doesn't get talked about so there's the poison indicators because yes many of them do have um poisons in them i mean people talk about red berries but there's a lot of edible red berries mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there are some poisonous red berries, but there's a lot of edible ones as well. And so you are kind of putting your, so this kind of goes on to the next point that yes, you can apply these tests and you should apply them properly with the exclusions at the beginning, because otherwise you, you can cause yourself some real problems because you can't differentiate between the plant you've positively identified or at least positively tested versus another plant that looks similar so you have to exclude the whole lot otherwise you risk poisoning yourself just because you can't follow up with your initial test safely and consistently um, and then also you're excluding unfortunately some potentially good plants with um, mm. some of the general poison indicators we've talked about milky saps red berries you know red currants are red mm. yeah raspberries are red you know there's some really good edible red berries that you might want to eat but if you if you follow the letter of the law yes you avoid the arrows on you yes you avoid holly berries yes you avoid some of the other poisonous berries around the world but you also then exclude some of the good edible palmate ones. leaves, yeah. the um, scissors hyperglauca mm. native grape, the yeah. edible grapes, yes. but they all have a palmate yes. leaf. So, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, w where that takes you to is that ideally you've got a higher level of knowledge, at least in terms of common and widespread plants that you find around the hemisphere that you're, that you're operating in. Um, I think the other reason why these taste tests are popular goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is people like simple answers. People think that things should be straightforward. Um, Gordon mentioned pea-like pods or pea pods being an exclusion, and that's also one of the exclusions I would mention because, again, um, the pea family, the Fabaceae, is difficult. Mm. Um, it's difficult for a number of reasons. One is, again, you can get something with a pea pod that's one plant and then you get another plant that has a pea pod or pea like pod that is a different plant but they look similar and one is edible and one's poisonous because there are poisonous plants in the pea family and that surprises many people because we're so used to again go, we go into the store and we buy fresh garden peas we buy mange too we buy sugar snap peas and we we buy runner beans and green beans and we think anything of that structure is good because the only ones we're ever presented with are edible mm. and they're either edible because we've selectively bred them to be edible or they're edible because we just we just cultivate the edible ones but there are plenty of uh, Fabaceae species out there that are seriously poisonous that if you eat the if you eat the fruits out of the pea pods you will kill yourself and um, others will make you seriously ill but they're more complicated still because it, some of them are poisonous in the spring and okay later in the year. Some of them are okay in the spring and poisonous later in the year. So unless you know anything about peas and the Fabaceae, so vetches, peas, wild peas, etc., you just have to exclude all of them because it's too hard. It's in the too hard basket. The carrots are in the too hard basket, peas are in the too hard basket, which is why you see the exclusions when you see when the test is properly presented, exclude anything with white umbelliferous flowers exclude anything with pea like pods etc etc so that you're not trying to differentiate between plants that you don't have the technical skills to differentiate between that are potentially going to poison you but then of course because you don't have that granular granular knowledge you're missing out on some good edibles potentially as well and that's that's the downside so you're limited to things that are likely not to be toxic that you can also, once you've identified it as not toxic, you can differentiate from other plants that 
um, that are around it that it doesn't look too similar to poisonous species that are similar so you 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 it's it, it's 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 a valid test it works but it's very limited in practice um, in some in some environments because you're excluding so much from even testing in the first place that could form valid food if you knew a bit more about the local uh, botany and the original well the, when that was set up which is I believe um, was a, a military had its origins in it, it was practically like World War two down pilots being mm -hmm. forced down in an area they had no knowledge about um, soldiers in the field air for air crew in the field dying not because of their primary injuries originally um, but because they couldn't find food mm -hmm. and poisoning them poisoning themselves from something they shouldn't have eaten so the test test evolved for okay what are some basic guidelines that, that can help soldiers air crew sailors in the field to help them get by and of course, with the, in the case of air crew, they're flying vast distances at, at a much greater speed, so they could find themselves in completely unrelated areas um, and with more differing vegetation on, on a scale. So, yeah. so d d for them, but in the case of say in hostile terrain, um, someone that's on the on the ground is also it's not just a what's um, a permissive environment, yes. friendly environment, it's a hostile environment. So then they're trying to avoid capture as well. So they can't just sit there and just like experiment with plants. They need to be on the move. Mm -hmm. So an edibility test depend well in its correct form with all the um, everything applied as it should be. That takes a long, long time. So be, unless yeah. you're tiny, yeah. so and if you're admitting the boot, you're trying to um, prevent capture being followed up. You don't have the time to do that. Well, you may have, but. Um, that was say as many many years ago but now the the technology the resources exist for soldiers and uh, air crew and 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 the, and, the and, and civilian people to be able to research plants and know enough about to know the common plants in those areas so you don't have to do a test like that and to me that's it's um you could there's there's a number of common plants in certain areas and if you should uh, or hopefully you know even from an air crew's point of view you know what area you're going to fly over you, or the area you're going to be operating in or the area you're going on a holiday in mm. you should be you know doing some study okay what are the common plants in this area just like i'm in an unfamiliar na area now and but at least okay trying to identify at least eight to ten plants in that area in the boreal forest even in the country you're going to there are sort of really dangerous plants learn what they are learn eight or you know what a, a reasonable amount that's not overloading yourself of plants you can learn to me that's not that hard to do even at a, at a superficial level or at least i say not superficial a minimal level to learn those things surely and do the work my gripe with um, military um, and being in the military and I can say this being in the military and I'm not mean to be negative is that what I see and or is that is that the, the general plant ID and plant identification and I have nowhere near the amount of knowledge that you that you have with this is that plant plant identification is the heart of bushcraft and survival and as you've said before there can be no bushcraft and survival trying to be plant because plants are and and uh, and trees are your resources food resources for everything yeah. and that is at the heart of bushcraft you look at like sweden um and how um some of the chaps have spoken to over there how they review it, it is the heart of everything yet i find that in military circles today it is the poorest um, area that, that people have the poorest knowledge about and people tend to shy away from because they have yeah. limited plant knowledge so to make up for that the edibility test is just home because that's all people learn yeah, it's easy it, to learn it, that it, instead it, of the plant. it can be used as a crutch i mean i think properly applied it's it's a valid tool so say even if you did have your 10 most common widespread useful um edible plants in an area um if you were stuck in that area for a long time you could start testing other plants that you didn't know using the edibility test but you need to understand it properly you need to understand the exclusions which often aren't portrayed even within military training circles 
Uh, I mean, I've seen training aid memoirs from various militaries around the world where those exclusions are not on the cards. Yeah, which is it's just um, partial information, which is dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. So people need to be taught about the exclusions um, and then people need to understand how to apply it properly and also what the limitations are. And again, I don't often see people explaining what you should be targeting. You should not target all plants in an area um, equally. Like for example, there's a lot of bracken in this area, right? There's a lot of leafy bracken and regardless of what you know about bracken, I wouldn't be testing the bracken leaves. If I didn't know mm. what bracken was and I'm like, well, there's mm. a lot of this plant in this area, I'm not going to be testing the leaves. I'm going to be testing the roots mm. because that's where I'm going to get the energy. And I don't see that no. taught very much that you should focus on roots, shoots and fruits. Mm. That's those are the things that you should be doing. All the buckets, the, 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 yeah. the crow's ears and the fiddleheads. Yeah, yeah. And that well, and there's, there's that. But that's going into yeah. the specifics of that mm. particular species. But the, the general point is you need to know what to prioritize when you're using that test. You need to know the exclusions. You need to know what to prioritize if you are applying it. But I completely agree with you, Gordon, that ideally sitting above that, the edibility test can be a backstop, but sitting above that should be more, uh, more actual specific plant knowledge. Um, Morse Kohansky um, used to say that 70% of bushcraft is tree and plant knowledge. And you can argue about maybe where certain bits of knowledge sit, but it's, if you absolutely include knowledge of mater processing materials for tinder bundles, so taking out in, you know, damp inner barks and separating them out from the outer bark and drying them to use as a, as a tinder, medicinal plants, um, food plants, plants for cordage, plants that indicate water, etc etc if you do not know much about trees and plants you are like a child in mm. that environment and um, people spend way too much time talking about gear so people spend way too much time talking about other other aspects tree and plant knowledge um, along with knowledge of the animals uh, and, and the birds and and to an extent the fungi in an environment are the key things that you need um, and then you need some skill with cutting tools and that's what makes you good in the bush that that knowledge natural navigation and those things as well but trees and plants really yeah they are the bulk of the knowledge of a particular environment and as you've alluded to for for air crew it's hard to get that level of knowledge in, in, in detail of you know areas that they might be operating in you know if you think about an Australian Air Force pilot they might be operating over Australia but then they might also be operating in the northern hemisphere somewhere they might be based somewhere for, for a campaign or what have you and um, they may be operating over Asian jungle they may be operating over the northern um, parts of Australia they may be operating um, elsewhere in the world and, and so to have you know when their main area of expertise is operating the aircraft to have detailed knowledge of every single environment they might be operating in is, is probably a, a very tall order. But what you can do is, as, as someone who is an educator of um, these skill sets, is look at what's common and widespread across a whole um, biome. Mm. Yeah. So, and some plants are even more widespread than that. So, you know, at the top of pretty much anybody's list for knowing um, from a survival perspective is, is the, the typhaceae, mm. the, the tifas in particular, the genus tifa, you Cat have cattails, Kumbangi, yeah. yeah. So there's a number of different species and they all look very, very similar. If you know one, you know the others. It's not like they're all vastly different. Um, so if you know tifa latifolia that we were collecting yep. here this week, you'd not also know tifa angustifolia, which is the less common and slightly smaller plant that's also native to this part of the world you'd recognize one you recognize the other if I came to Australia I'd recognize Tifa orientalis yeah exactly yeah. because they look very very similar it. and all the uses carry over as well the uses of the leaves the uses of the rhizomes for, 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 for food you can eat the shoots you can eat the base of the stems you can eat the pollen and you can use the seed heads for fire lighting you can sometimes use the stems for hand drill you can use the leaves for matting for cordage um, absolutely fantastic bushcraft and survival plant you should know those mm. 
Yeah. If you're at all interested in bushcraft and survival, that's a plant you should know. Yet and I've seen um, instructors mm. in different films have that right in front of them and not know what it is. An another one, like yeah. from um, Northern Australia, Pandanus. Mm -hmm. um, Pandanus spiralis, Pandanus aquaticus, um, Pandanus base dowie. Um, supermarket food, string fire, food, cordage. But I've seen that in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. I've seen it in Hawaii, and I've seen it um, in Panama, all around that tropical belt. And there's a number, that's examples of different yeah. different areas different zones, where yeah. you should know the equatorial reason. Yeah. There's probably, you could get five plants, and of course poisonous ones. Mm. To me, and you could do, I mean, Bush, um, Les Hiddens, Bush Tucker Mam, he, he did a similar thing on a, on a smaller scale by putting his snack maps on the back of the maps. And I know paper maps, hard form, don't exist that much anymore, but it was a great, great idea. Because in that, and you, you could do that for equatorial regions mm -hmm. and for different areas. And I think that um, was, a, was a great idea, but unfortunately yeah. they're not done anymore. No, no. Um, well, I think the, the most important poisonous plants to know are the ones that look similar to edible plants. I think those are the first ones for people to learn um, and that forms a framework of avoidance and you know, where they grow and where they grow yeah yeah so if you in a particular zone or biome if you understand what are the poisonous because there are some poisonous plants that look nothing like edible plants right so if you're learning edible plants and you mistake make a mistake you're unlikely to eat one of these because it looks nothing like any of the edible ones where you're likely to make a mistake is where you've learned an edible plant you're still kind of coming to grips with that knowledge and then you take a poisonous species that looks similar so the, the, the ones you really need to know from us from a food perspective in an environment are the poisonous plants that look similar to the edible plants and then then you can differentiate so that's an area of botanical training that people should you know and i don't see that that's mm. another that isn't being done yeah it's uh yeah but that but then that goes back to the the exclusions in that the reason a number of those exclusions exist in the edibility test is because they are the the families or the 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 groups of plants where there are edible species that look similar to poisonous plants so they're just excluded but if you if you want to then start to learn more about edible plants in a particular area you need to know the poisonous species that look similar to some of the common and widespread mm. edible plants because then you avoid making mistakes so it's about doing the work it's about, like there should be a minimal every 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 teacher every structure there's a minimal amount of, amount of plants you should know in your area and you should know them inside out back to front um, I think that's not that hard to do really even if you were to target because I know a lot of people think oh that's too many plants to learn now I am coming here completely new area there is some are familiar with and this you know I've been bombarded with stuff and you can learn things superficially then you can have an in such and yourself as a, like beyond an in-depth knowledge I mean look, but you don't have to have a botanical knowledge for this no but there should be a minimal level you know you can easily identify go through some um, some important points about what it should have as not as one of those poison indicators or um, it's not one of the exclusions um, and then hopefully if you know that plant you can identify it easy you don't even have to do any of that and if yes. it's common and widespread in the area and you know it's a common and wi widespread you can go straight to that plant yeah. you don't have to worry well, about a great stuff. example right now Okay, great example here right now. If you parachuted into this area and you were unfamiliar with it, could quite happen here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you came into this area and you're unfamiliar, something that you would spot that there's a lot of at the moment are the berries on on brambles, or blackberries. Yeah. So there's these briars, like the long. Rubus, yeah. yeah, the rubus. There's these long um, trailing stems with quite large leaves that got thorns on, create impenetrable areas but there's these compound Victorians fruits. Victorians are familiar with this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will be, yeah. But there's these compound fruits on them and there's a lot of, ri and they, they ripen over a period of time so they provide food over an extended sort of mid to late summer period and they're really good eating, they're really tasty, they require no processing, they don't really look like anything else other than raspberries which are also edible. Um, they've got good sugars, they've got good vitamin C, there's lots of them. Um, 
easy to collect. You can, if you even if you're on the move, which a military mm. person might be, you can pick them as you go, um, and just eat them straight away. But if you didn't know what they were, you'd have to spend 24 hours testing them. Mm. Where, and the, th the interesting thing for me is that even my students who come along, who don't know a lot about tree and plant identification, they might even struggle to differentiate between some of the common trees here. Most people at some point in their lives have been introduced to blackberries or brambles. Yeah? It's rare that I meet anybody mm. who comes on a course with me um, who isn't just happy to start pulling brambles off a bush. Yeah? They might be really tentative and concerned when we show them other, other plants, but they're very happy. Even before you show them, they're like, oh, there's some nice ripe brambles here. And that's because they've been taught that when they were younger and they're confident. And th that's all we're talking about, really, in terms of learning a few plants. Like, if you knew brambles, if you knew a few other things in this environment, you can start getting food quite easily. But if you didn't know even those few plants, it would take days and days and days to test them um, to make sure they're edible. You know, because you've got to you've got to test them in isolation. You've got to ingest them in isolation when your stomach doesn't contain anything else, and you're going to be hungry. You know, mm. and so it, it's just a few plants that are common and widespread in an area, and maybe you need some different ones for different seasons. Because of course, you're not going to get blackberries in the spring. Mm. You're not going to get them in the depths of winter, but mid to late summer, you know, there's a three month period probably where you can get blackberries mm. here. Um, if you knew them and you knew a few other plants, you could get food mm. here even on the move. And it's it's that kind of level of knowledge we're talking about. We're not talking about learning hundreds and hundreds yeah. of plants for all different seasons. It's just a few common widespread plants that are easy to recognize and differentiate that you could know for a given, mm. what, you know, you get these all over the UK, all over Western and Northern Europe, all over Eurasia, all over North America, you get this type of type of berry in, in some some places more or less. And then they've been introduced into, into more areas still, like you've yeah. talked about with, um, with the uh, Victorian, Victorian. The yeah, and then you up in the hills, you get the dewberries, these compound type fruits that are in the rose family. Once you know those, there's food all over the place. Mm. Well, it's yeah. like the same as right up and down the east coast of Australia. The spine headed mat rush, the mm. uh, Lamandra longifolia, edible root bases. You can make, um, even though they're bloody hard to pound up, you can make flour out of those. Mm -hmm. But the edible leaf bases, you can get the same with the sausage. Mm -hmm. Not doesn't taste as nice, but it's everywhere. Yes, and it's really easy to identify. It's plentiful, grows all up mm -hmm. and down, and that mm -hmm. should be that's a target plant. And, yes. and it has many uses, you know, for fire, for mm -hmm. the dead leaves for fire. It makes cordage. It's like a, a supermarket plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got many uses, and that's easy to identify, just mm -hmm. like that. And, and the Banksia species, which once yes. again, right across Australia, and the same things, you know, you know, uh, the. The, the flowers when, when they've got nectar in are great for making a sweet drink and that's mm -hmm. what Aboriginal people um, used to and still do the, the, the small seeds in the Banksia serrata and the same th things fire all up and down the coast and there's so, and they're the, the target widespread um, plants and that's what I would like to see and that's not hard to learn a few because then you're learning you might know exactly which one, but you say, okay, that's a Banksia. I can definitely see that's a Banksia, so therefore it's got mm -hmm. these uses, because they're all common, common uses. The same with the, a lot of the Melaleucas and, right. and that yep. one, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you've got the um, G-bungs, the Pasunias. Of mm -hmm. course, they've all got the same fruit they ripen and when they hit the ground, there's many of those in the northern northern parts. There's very, very, all the sand, all the Liverstoners, another mm -hmm. one, the, the growing the growing tips of all the Liverstoners, whether it's... Um, the cabbage tree palm, Liverstoner australis. Up in northern Australia, it's um, Liverstoner humilis. The cabbage, the the, uh, the edible cabbage, they're all edible. Kills the plant though, mm. and targeting those. I mean, they were targeted too much down mm. the east coast, mm. the, mm -hmm. as, and uh, 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 they were almost wiped out. But great food source. Now they're not hard to do. That's mm -hmm. our, our equivalent to yes. e uh, easily identifiable plants. So yeah. Do the work, learn some plants, and spend the time knowing those quite well. Yeah. And it's not hard to get eight in your area. No, and if you can learn from someone who actually has already thought about it in those terms, then you're going to get up the learning curve that much more quickly, right? So, yeah. Radio. Yeah, yeah. Well, that. But like I say, don't exclude the edibility test, but. 
do understand that it's presented really poorly in many places, both amateurishly just on the internet, but also in some professional circles. It's not completely explained. It's not explained how you would actually apply it properly in context. And it's also shouldn't be presented as a, as a catch-all you know, solution to not learning plants because you should learn some plants and then have this as a backstop and understand it properly with the exclusions, with the prioritizations that sit that should sit within it but often aren't explained. So. Have the knowledge first and use it as a backup. Mm, if you yeah. really yeah. yeah, if you really have no idea where you are, I mean the chances unless someone kidnaps you, blindfolds you and goes and, and throws you off in an area on the different side of the world. Particularly as, hard, a, particularly as a civilian, unless mm. you're a tourist in completely out of your normal area of operation and you're in a light aircraft crash um, or in a vehicle breakdown situation where you're not rescued for more than a week, you don't need to know any of this stuff anyway. Mm. Paul, could you, as far as a source, a civilian source, or it doesn't need to be a civilian source, and do you know, what could you, do you know any examples of where you see the test the most accurate say form of that test that you've seen written down um, the Davenport Greg Davenport's book has it reasonably well explained um, his wilderness survival skills I'm not sure if that book's in print at the moment but Greg Davenport's because he's uh, a US uh, he was a US he was a US Air Force uh, survival instructor um, he uh, he wrote quite a compact concise survival book um, if you just Google Greg Davenport Wilderness Survival Skills, you should find it. Um, you'll be able to get second-hand copies on eBay and, and Amazon, etc. And it's explained pretty well in that in that because it has the exclusions at the beginning. But I don't believe it really talks about prioritising. It might do, but I know from talking to people like Tom Luchens, who was um, U.S. Air Force survival instructor, retired. Um, he would teach the prioritisations, but he would also teach things like learning typhacia you know one of the things that he joked about um was that you know if you were ejected and parachuted into an area of uh, cattail you were you were laughing you were mm. sorted yeah so they did teach some plants certainly um but the edibility test was also taught properly and completely by those people so wonderful yeah well, that might be a, a good place to uh, sign off. Mm. I mean, could, we could literally <laughs> open things up here. And it's a fascinating area. So, but basically, to yeah, sum up, learn some plants in your area. Learn eight to ten that's achievable, that are common, widespread, um, and easily e easy, processed. Yeah, easily processed. And well. that are going to be um, beneficial yeah, yeah. to you, um, Worth your time. as a way of targeting targeting those plants and learn and learn those first and use this as a backup yeah and uh, yeah and also know what those exclusions are yeah absolutely yeah. and if you don't know what hemisphere in you're really bushed you should <laughs> at least have some idea well Paul it's been an absolute pleasure um, being over here again mm -hmm. for the symposium uh, coming and doing the intermediate course which is fantastic Thank and you. for all of you if you ever get the chance to come over and do one of Paul's courses um, he's elementary he's got tracking courses he's got the forest hunter course his navigation courses um, his intermediate course do the whole whole suite and I will be doing that and come and do them all again because you never stop learning it's fantastic there is so many courses over here some very very I'm blown away by the number of good quality schools over mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. such a small area it really is fantastic and um, I'll be over here as often as you can Paul also has a fantastic um, online course he's online elementary uh, bushcraft course and don't be fooled by the word elementary it is not well it actually that's the skill level you should have and if you can't get over here by all means do it I've done it a couple of times and I'll and it's a lifelong course you can have it for as long as you can it's fantastic it's um it's there's so much on information in there so I can't um recommend enough that you get stuck into that there's a whole you know on plan on all the topics of bushcraft and more they're in there professionally filmed um, PowerPoint presentations it really is wonderful and you can watch it over and over again it's a base knowledge for bushcraft 
particularly all the things we've talked with all the things we've talked about that's a great fundamental skill for all of those in fact all of our students on our courses I encourage them all to go and do Paul's course so if you can't come over here in person by all means do that course it is fantastic um, Paul also has an online uh, planned identification course which I have but due to time I'm still trying to um, get around to doing it's all it, it is based on the northern hemisphere plants but Paul links to plants in the southern hemisphere but it's, it's it's fantastic he's like the bushcraft scientist this guy as we call him but amazing botanical knowledge amazing botanical knowledge but which is of course is what we're talking about is the heart of, of bushcraft and survival training so it really really is an important area so I can't recommend that enough so you've got a couple of different different options there um, you can find Paul's website at yeah so all, all of my free stuff you can find just at paulkirtley.co.uk so that's articles videos podcasts etc um, and everything else is linked from there my social media my my field courses etc but if you're particularly interested in the field courses and expeditions um, which are offered through my company Frontier Bushcraft you can actually go straight to frontierbushcraft.com and if you're really interested in the and again everything's linked from there um, and if you're specifically interested in the online courses you can go to onlinebushcraftcourses.com where the online tree and plant identification masterclass as well as the online elementary and the continuation study series which sits on top of the online elementary they're all housed there but as I say you can get to all of them from from the others and um, so just google me Paul Kirtley you'll find paulkirtley.co.uk and then you'll be able to shoot off to everywhere else from there um, and if people want to get um, once again we mentioned it but can you mention again how people can get to, to see um, the or purchase copies for the global Bush oh yeah project? the GBS so we had 30 odd speakers and um, all of the presentations with bar a couple were recorded um, and they were down to the speakers requesting not to be recorded but the vast majority of all the presentations were recorded and they um, have been pre professionally filmed edited with the slides edited in as well and uh, the audio is excellent on all of them and we recorded those for posterity and they are available as a package to download and just go to global bushcraft symposium 2022.com or just google global bushcraft symposium it should be the first website that comes up in google go to that site and just there's a in the main menu it says get the videos and you can purchase the videos there so great mm -hmm. well it's been fantastic seeing you again and let's hope we do it again soon yeah absolutely lot, my Paul. pleasure gone as always cheers. yeah cheers Thank you.